We last left them perched at what seemed the edge of the world. Unlucky to be stuck in no man's land on the Bangladesh side of the border with Myanmar, stunned by the violence and the scale of it. A man speaking for them, Dil Mohammed, even afraid to show his face. I don't want to stay here. I want to go back as soon as possible. I appeal the world body to more and more pressure to stop genocide on our Rohingyas. A year later, we are in Myanmar. And genocide is a word far more readily used abroad to describe what happened to Rohingya Muslims here. Myanmar, rejecting the charge and refusing outside investigators, tells an alternative version of the story. Partly through controlled access to Rakhine State, where the atrocities unfolded. We too were invited to visit escorted by Ministry of Information officials. So can we spend just a little bit more time in Indian then? We asked to see case. specific villages. They insisted the agenda was set and don't ask the drivers to stop, they said. It is a long way to northern Rakhine. And we are late. A year and hundreds of thousands of refugees late. But by seeing even glimpses, we might still gain insight. It's horrific weather today. Lightning, thunderstorms, and a lot of rain. It would have been something like this almost exactly a year ago when thousands of people were trying to get from Myanmar to Bangladesh on waters not far from here. It's no wonder so many of them died at sea. Immediately striking as we drive north into the killing zone, the haunting hints of the raised Rohingya Muslim villages that remain. Look at that right there. What, you, what look like uh, coconut trees that have had their tops taken off. Oh, here's a few more here. And what we've been told is that those are the remnants of villages that had been burned. Wow, look at that. Wow, actually there's more. As we speed by, one village, Chen Kali, we could only identify with the help of a map phone app. Human Rights Watch says 700 buildings were burned down here in a systemic campaign. There's nothing left to come back to. Also striking, a lot of building is going on. As the acknowledged site of a massacre, the village of Indin seemed a peculiar place for a first stop. Burned are mostly the Muslim sections, the rest left intact. Not a single Rohingya Muslim resident is left. And they're probably not coming back, says the village administrator. He says the new homes are for new Rakhine and Hindu residents. The revelation of the massacre and mass grave here led to prison sentences for seven Burmese soldiers involved but also for the Reuters journalists who investigated it. There is nothing left of any kind of evidence that anything untoward happened here. And furthermore, people here essentially saying they don't know of such a massacre. An older couple finally let us in. Taqin Tenji had a tea shop where the Muslim kids also hung out. She says they warned her about an impending attack. She uses a derogatory name for Muslims. Rakhine Buddhists killing Muslims is just one out of a hundred, she says. The difference between Rakhine and Muslim is that Rakhine Buddhists are kind and feel for others, she says. So many more questions. But it was time to go. A long ride down the road. The district of Mangda, once overwhelmingly Rohingya Muslim, traders, laborers, rickshaw drivers, long without rights to citizenship or freedom of movement. Now, half a million of them simply gone. Local officials call them Bengali, and they tell us they're working and rebuilding to bring them back. They reject accusations of genocide or ethnic cleansing in their midst. 
For me, I don't believe it, says U Yi Du, the Mengda district deputy director. I wonder who you blame for the burnings of, of these villages. It was the terrorist group, he says, known here as ARSA, the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. He later showed a video he says is proof. If there's a genocide going on, how come Muslims are still here, says this official. They also blame the group for preventing Rohingya from coming back. No one mentions the resistance in some parts here to such returns. We're introduced to Marmak Shayi and his family. He says he returned on foot from Bangladesh, and he echoes the local officials. Why did you decide to tell your story? Why is it important? My properties and house were burnt, he says. We're living like beggars. I was so angry, and it happened because of Arsa. That's why I'm talking to the media, so the world knows. The next day, after several hours on bumpy roads, we arrive at that border. Here, they say, is the proof of Myanmar's commitment to repatriating Rohingya, a reception center ready to welcome them. But there are none for us to meet. Only 171 people have returned since it opened in January. Nearly a million wait in Bangladesh, in what's become the world's largest refugee camp. Officials here again blame ARSA, and oddly, Bangladesh. In a new report, the UNHCR says, the conditions are not yet in place for a safe, dignified return. At the so-called zero line, we have the chance to ask why. It's that same camp we visited a year ago, this time from the other side of the border. It's grown from about 1,000 to 5,000 people. Dil Mohammed is still here. He no longer hides his face, and he still wants to go home. Still no situation to save for us in Myanmar. You prefer to stay there than to come here? We affect our life. Food is not important for us. Our main important is permanent and get, and get permanent solution, sustainable solution about Rohingya's issue. It must do the, the ICC. Crucial to that, he says, must be a trial at the International Criminal Court. And will they have something to come back to? Citizenship, the villages, free movement. Or has their expulsion been cemented on the ground? Why do you think the government bring the media here to meet you guys? I think you are not free, you are not, you are not independent. It is organized by our government of Myanmar. It's time to go again. Please take a seat. There we go. It's a very long way to go to get to the other side of the fence one year later. And the irony of being told across that fence that on this tour, we are not free media. But we have seen glimpses of a troubled region fundamentally transformed, the palpable absence demands accountability. And Nala joins us now from our bureau in London. We heard the UN Special Rapporteur for Myanmar saying today the country is unable and unwilling to investigate what happened in Rakhine State, that the international community has to step up. And, and how is the idea of an outside investigation being received in Myanmar? Well, not very warmly, Ian. I had a chance to speak to Professor Ong Tan Tech, who is the head of a private public organization headed by Ong San Suu Kyi, which is tasked with helping Rakhine State get past this crisis. And he said Myanmar's own investigation is enough to satisfy their concerns. We would not do it because of international pressure. We would do it because we think it's needed. So it would be on our terms, you know, at our pace, and uh, whatever we think suits uh, you know, the whole nation. And so why is there so much skepticism about their ability to do this? Well, it has a lot to do with past experience. Uh, Nicholas Bekelen, who's the East Asia director at Amnesty International, uses words like zero credibility in describing Myanmar's ability to investigate alone. Here's what he had to say. 
Uh, Myanmar has a history of setting up these uh, investigative uh, commissions, um, um, and none of them have yielded uh, any kind of results. Uh, we also have to remember that uh, under Myanmar's constitution, uh, the Tatmado, the military, is above uh, the law and above uh, this type of uh, investigation by a, a civilian uh, body. Uh, so uh, from the get-go, it's basically impossible possible to investigate what has uh, happened. Ian, I should also add that the government is allowing access to northern Rakhine State, but when they have, as you've seen, it's usually been quite controlled. And it's not for everybody. The UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Myanmar has never been allowed in the country at all. Ian. All right, Nala, thank you. You're welcome.